let's take another step back now and talk about AI applications in general. So we got into this a little bit a few minutes ago when you were talking about McKinsey consultants at Data Robot being sent out as this army of people working on use cases. So with your role as chief customer officer at Data Robot, as well as your senior director of analytics and research role at Travelers before that, you've been in the deep end of AI development for a wide array of businesses and use cases. Greg, why do so many AI projects fail? Um, that's a good question. Uh, part of it, I think, is a framing problem. Uh, you know, specifying a, a project uh, in a way that will give you uh, a good outcome, right? So I've I've specified what my tar- what my goal is, like uh, you know that the data exists, that the business agrees that that problem is actually the problem that needs to be solved. Uh, the whole project origination, project framing kind of thing is is really important. And a lot of times, what you'll see is that there are really big disconnects between the data science teams that can actually frame problems and the business teams that actually know what the problem is, if you know what I mean. So you, you sometimes will see a data scientist or a da- team of data scientists building solutions um, that if the business team knew what they were building, they would know from the get-go that that would never work, right? Like it's not answering the right question or the right data is not going to be available or, you know, the timing's not going to work out or, you know, it's already, it's, it's providing a trivial answer. Like that happens an awful lot is that somebody builds a model to predict something. Uh, but the prediction is, is obvious. Like it's not better than what a person could do. And the volume's not big enough to actually, uh, sort of warrant any, any type of automation. The implementation is also a hard part around the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the success of these projects. So like we worked with a bank, uh, a data robot to implement a, uh, a solution that was actually really novel. The, it was it had to do with the foreign exchange market, uh, and I don't think I can go into details for what the particular problem was. But th- what this bank did is they uncovered a uh, almost like a glitch in the system that allowed them to be really smart about how they did currency tr- uh, currency transfers, and uncovered like almost like a half a billion dollars in annual revenue, new revenue on this new product, like a massive amount of revenue. It took them three or four years to get it implemented, which is crazy. And the amount of bureaucracy that this bank was facing when it came to like uh, actually implementing this project was remarkable. Like it, it was. So it's not it like was, two two billion dollars in losses by just not getting that up and running. Yeah, exactly, bonkers. But the thing about it was, is in order to implement this model, they had to touch core systems, and the course like the system that actually did the currency transfers. Like you can't, that system can have zero downtime. You know what I mean? Like, so everybody was super nervous about making changes because the, if that system goes down, the losses are way, way bigger than the gains would have been if the, if the project had actually, actually been implemented. So there's a lot of bureaucracy and change management and, and implementation challenges and and stuff like that, that, that you encounter as well. So then, then the third thing I would say is that there's, and this may be a little controversial, there's not that many out there. Uh, a lot of people will go out and say, look, you know, every business should have thousands of machine learning models in production. And there's, you know, there's, there's trillions. I, I think I remember our, our CEO doing an interview with, uh, in a magazine where he said there should be trillions of AI models out there that are constantly being updated and used and, and, uh, you know, making life better and all that kind of stuff. I don't think there's that many, right? Like I think at a, at an organization, you might have dozens, like at a mature organization, that has has been doing machine learning for a long time there's just not that many uh opportunities to do now the ones that you actually get deployed those are going to generate tons of value by all means organizations need to be interacting with their data uh in important ways whether that's building dashboards or training models or, or whatever it might be but you know like how many are there really <laughs> Because you got to, in order to find a project that is actually deployable, you, the stars have to align. Like you have to have the data, you have to do the work to build the models, but then you have to have business buy-in. You've got to have IT support to actually do the deployments. You've got to have, you know, all the the cloud stuff has to be all set up in terms of infrastructure. You've got to have all the connections. Like it's a lot of work to get these things built. Yeah, and maintaining them in production to make sure that there's not the various kinds of drift that you can encounter. That's something that, yeah, even in my own data science team, we're relatively small. 
there's only including myself, which is generous because I'm like not I'm not ever writing production code, but including myself, there's five data scientists in our company. And so how many machine learning models can we get into production before the entirety of our data science resources is consumed by keeping machine learning models live without even doing any new development? It's not very many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. And there is that whole the whole industry of ML ops that has so, sort of come about. Uh, but I think I think arguably the market's not really ready for a lot of that ML ops stuff. I mean, most organizations probably don't have any deployed machine learning models. All but I mean, your biggest ones certainly will. But you know, your medium sized companies, how many of those are actually doing that kind of work? So, well, I think we're a while away from having all those implement implementation challenges solved, uh, so that we can you know, actually, actually get there with these projects. Yeah. This highlights, I sometimes get questions from listeners via social media or my YouTube channel where people ask things like, is there any point in getting started as a data scientist still, or are tools like GPT-4 or GPT-6 uh, that's coming or uh, AutoML, are these just going to re replace data scientists? And I think you're hitting on exactly why there's going to be even more demand in the future for data scientists, which is that uh, there are so, except for the biggest organizations, the biggest big tech companies, they have for years now figured out how to be capturing in data operational processes within their company, as well as involving their customers, their users. And so they have been able to stand up dozens, maybe in the largest cases like your Googles, your Metas, maybe there's over a hundred machine learning models. Uh, but most companies, Huge companies, billions and billions of dollars of revenue. They might have a handful of machine learning models in production. And so there's so much opportunity for them to be capturing so much more data and to be implementing so many more models. And so I think demand will continue to grow and grow and grow. The previous, um, so I, we release two episodes a week. We have episodes on Tuesdays and Fridays. The Tuesday episodes are always long. So they're pretty much always at least an hour long. And so... Um, a couple of long episodes ago, I said two weeks ago, we had episode 749 where Kirill Aramenko, he actually founded the Super Data Science Podcast and he was host of the show for the first four years. I've just been, I've just been doing it for the last three and a bit now. And Kirill was on the show as a guest and he was talking about large language models. It was an intro to LLMs episode. And he was making the case at the beginning of the episode that right now, people who are experts in LLMs can command huge salaries, and that will probably go down over time, kind of as it has for data scientists. He was saying, you know, 10, 12 years ago, data scientists could have these huge salaries. But everything that I see, I've been thinking about this a bunch since we recorded this episode, and I don't think I articulated it very well then. I was surprised by the argument I was making because the median data scientist salary has been continuing to go up over the last 10 years. <laughs> and it's because of even, like, we create even more demand. The more data scientists there are creating machine learning models, getting them into production, the more opportunities there are for organizations to be capturing data within their organization from users, from counterpart organizations that they work with. And therefore, it's this constant blossoming of opportunities for automation. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. I also think that we need to expand kind of our definition of what data science is. Because, uh, you know, in, in, in school, data science is like training models. But really, there's so much more to it than that. Uh, I, I'm always surprised when I run into data scientists that don't know how to write SQL code. Because it's like, how are you going to get the data in the first place? And there's a ton of value in just being able to go and get your own data. You know what I mean? Uh, sure. And then on the other side of the coin is this whole, this whole kind of machine learning engineering kind of field. So, you know, let's say I have a model. Let's say I uh, w I need to figure out what to do with it. Well, there's a whole whole pile of technologies there to set up like a, you know, if you want some sort of a scheduled job or if you want to create an API, if you want to host that thing, like there's an awful lot of stuff there uh, that you just, you need to know in order to to really generate value. And so I think the the window is actually opening bigger for for data scientists, but also the bar is getting higher because the amount of things that you're needing to do now that the technology is more mature and the amount of data is bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the amount of things you have to be able to do is, is just, it's just more, more intense. 
Yeah, it's interesting. There are certainly there's a there's a wider range of problems that people could be solving. But I think also something interesting that's happened, and I don't want to get dragged into this too much. I've got other like <laughs> more specific questions for you, but just this is kind of an interesting conversation to be having. And hopefully lots of our listeners find it interesting because they are either thinking about getting into data science or they're or at some point in the data science career. Um, is that I think that um data scientists, it it seems like while salaries, while median salary for data scientists has gone up over the ten over the last 10 years, 10 years ago, it was typically a requirement to have a PhD in a quantitative subject or like a related uh, a field related to data science. Well, I mean, there was nothing called data science 10 years ago. You couldn't get a degree in that. But, you know, like a math degree, a stats degree, a programming degree, you, you typically had to have a PhD in one of these kinds of areas. And now it doesn't seem like you do. But I guess that's interesting because I guess it's the shift. Maybe 10 years ago, you kind of needed the PhD because the assumption was you were going to be the kind of person that was building models, which is something that like, you know, that kind of working independently, having hypotheses is like this PhD kind of stuff. But now 10 years on, it is the kinds of these either are much broader kinds of problems that we're tackling. Maybe you don't need to be that much of an expert in modeling itself, because maybe if you get the data inflows right, and you've got the downstream processes engineered right, maybe it is just an auto ML problem in the middle, and you don't need a PhD to be tackling it. Um, but simultaneously, there's this there's pressure to be learning tons of additional software engineering skills around the core data science modeling work. Yeah, I, I think about a lot of the data science work almost like you know being a plumber or an electrician. You know, it's, it's a, in a lot of ways it's a trade. Uh, you know, that you might go to trade school for if if such a thing existed here in the uh, in America. You know, I mean, learning to interact with data and build data pipelines and and do that and build deployments and that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of that is is boilerplate and something that you just learn and and figure out. But you're right. There's tons of research going on there. And, you know, the capability to take what you know about, say, how to train a random forest and extend that knowledge to include things like transformers and large language models and stuff like that. That's not straightforward. And it requires the kind of person that is a lifetime learner and, and, you know, is really passionate about this stuff. You know, the kind of person that has models for fantasy football and, and does data science in their free time and all that kind of stuff. And I think that will probably go away as, uh, as some of these concepts get incorporated more into, uh, like the education system, right? Where kids are going at, coming out of college, knowing about transformers and, and LLMs and all that kind of stuff. But we're definitely not there yet. <laughs> 